It's time, right? All right, good evening. Welcome to Maranatha Baptist Church. If you would find your seat in a songbook and turn to page 157, 157, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. And we'll sing all three verses and you can stand as we sing. I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, the way of the cross leads home. I must needs go on in the blood-sprinkled way, the path that the Savior trod. If I ever climb to the heights sublime Where the soul is at home with God The way of the cross leads home The way of the cross leads home It is sweet to know as I onward go The way of the cross leads home on the last then I bid farewell of the world to walk in it never more for my soul says where he waits at the open door the way of the cross leads home the way of the cross leads home it is sweet to know as I onward go the way of the cross leads home all right turn over we're going to try one that I haven't sang for a while so 412 412 moment by moment Dying with Jesus by death reckoned mine, living with Jesus a new life divine, looking to Jesus till glory does shine, moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am thine, moment by moment, I in his love moment by moment i've lied from above looking to jesus till glory does shine moment by moment oh lord i am thine never a trial that he doth not there, never a burden that he doth not bear, never a sorrow that he doth not share. Moment by moment, I'm under his care. Moment by moment, I'm kept in his love moment by moment i've lied from above looking to jesus till glory does shine moment by moment oh lord i am thine never a heartache and never a groan Never a teardrop and never a moan. Danger, but there on the throne, moment by moment, 
he thinks of his own moment by moment i'm kept in his love moment by moment i've life from above looking to jesus till glory does shine moment by moment oh lord i am thine never a weakness that he doth not feel that he cannot heal moment by moment in war and will jesus my savior abides with me still moment by moment i've kept in his love moment by moment i've life from above Looking to Jesus till glory does shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am not. That's good singing. You may be seated. I'll make a few announcements before I make the ushers come. Cause I got like three pages. Unless you want to do the announcements. All right, let's see here. Don't forget... Uh, Choir practice, I'm assuming next Sunday, 5.15 again, correct? Uh, we had a great practice tonight, so uh, if you don't want to sing in the choir, but you want to come and hear us practice, you probably get a blessing out of it. I enjoyed that to this evening, so thank you, Pastor, for uh, leading us on that. Um, also, sign-up sheet uh, in the back, uh, Soaring Eagles, Potluck, Saturday, March 14th from 2 to 4 here in the Fellowship Hall. So don't forget, forget that. Uh, don't forget uh, the funeral arrangement. For Brother Ron Taylor, uh, the viewing is tomorrow, 4 to 7, at Edwards Funeral Home in Arcola. The funeral services will be here Tuesday, and that's at 11 o'clock, and there'll be a meal afterwards. If you can help with the meal, see Mrs. Hafley on that. There will be no school here at the, church, uh, at the school here Tuesday. We're going to let the family have the church here uh, to mourn. Uh, Saturday the 29th. Uh, 10.30, bridal shower for Amber Redfern uh, here at the church. All ladies are invited to that. And then on March 7th at 7 o'clock, Blackwood Brothers here at uh, the church. And there's brochures on the Welcome Center. So make sure you grab those and pass those out, okay? Uh, March 8th at 3 o'clock, bridal shower for Savannah Murdoch uh, here at the church. And all ladies are invited for that. And then uh, be inviting for this March 15th through the 18th revival with Brother Phil Skipper. And that'll be a blessing. I always enjoy hearing him and when he comes. So make sure you uh, invite and get people in here to hear God's word. Uh, need help in the nursery? Did you get anybody to respond to you? One. Good. That's one more than what we had. So if you can help in the nursery in any way, uh, make sure you see Mrs. Hafley about that. And then uh, the new wall uh, back there, make sure we don't put anything on the new wall. All right, ushers, if you want to come, and we'll take our offering tonight. All right, we're going to need the plates, so. All right. While he's getting plates. While he's getting, while he's getting plates, let me just, uh, two, a couple of announcements real quick. Um, one is that, um, remember a week or so ago, I, I mentioned that we need about $5,800 to um, get the lights for the all, the, all the lights we need in the parking lot. And so uh, $500 came in this morning for that. You didn't even know that yet, right? So $500 came in for that. That's really great. You think about it, just a $100 bill. Um, if, you can, if you can spare a $100 bill, if you can spare a $50 bill, if you can spare a $20 bill, a $5 bill, a dollar bill, whatever you can spare for that, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm messing around up here. That would be a blessing, okay? Uh, and he mentioned the choir. Uh, our goal, just so you guys know, is to have or be ready for uh, the first Sunday that Phil Skipper's here, that revival meeting. 
So that's one we're planning on singing the first time, and we'll kind of debut our choir at that point. But I want you to come to every practice, those of you that come, and Stephen, wake up and come next week. And uh, anyone else that we can, uh, anyone else that wants to join, have a lot of fun, okay? Let's, uh, let's bow for prayer. You, you're going to flip those like a Frisbees or something? There you go. See, a uh, skill there. Real skill. Father, thank you for this offering. I pray that you bless it. God bless those who can give and those who cannot. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles out, if you would, and turn to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 12, 1 Kings chapter 12, I'm moving my prop here, all right, 1 Kings chapter 12, The Bible says in verse 1, Rehoboam uh, went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. So he says, take the yoke that your father had on us, make it lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, depart ye yet for three days, and come again to me. And the people departed. And King Reboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, how do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto, unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. So the, the advisors, the older guys, are saying, Look, um, you, if you just lighten up a little bit, you know, cut taxes. That's really what they were telling them. Cut taxes, take the burden off the people. He said, They'll serve you, and they'll, they'll, they'll come to your rallies. Make sense? They'll come and they'll listen to you. They'll line up outside the door. They'll, they'll just flood stadiums. They will. That's what older guys are saying. The young guys, uh, he, and the, but verse 8 says, But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him. So he goes to the millennials of that day. Seriously, I'm just trying to show you what happened. All young men are not stupid. Trust me. All old men are not wise. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> that didn't work? Okay. You knew who I saw him at though, didn't you? I just need to mess my hair up. So, um, the, uh, but the young men here, these millennials that came along, these socialists, that's what they were, he said to them, What counsel, verse 9, give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did upon, put upon us lighter? The young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than thy father's loins. And now whereas my father did lay... You with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. I'm going to tell you something. Um, this is, a, this is a, a, a word for young people. Uh, young people often don't have a filter. I write into you young men because you're strong. 
And oftentimes, body things come out. They laugh, you know, junior high boys, they laugh at junior high stuff. You know what I'm saying? As you get older, more mature, you're supposed to put a, put a bridle on that. You get what I'm saying? You see the young man speaking body, and hey, you know, let's make it, let's make it bigger, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna raise taxes, and we're gonna be worse than ever. And they're the kind of body the way they say it. And he says, verse eleven. Now, whereas my father did lay you with heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised with whips, but I will chastise with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the clause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake by Ahijah the, the Shelanite unto Jeroboam the son of Nebat. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed unto their tents. But as for the children of Israel, which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam set Adoram, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day. So basically what happened here, Solomon is, is reigning over Israel. David, David was a king. He was a loved king. And Solomon became a king after him. And Solomon's, the period of Solomon's reign was so wealthy, the Bible says that, that um, silver was like pebbles in the street. It was a very, very wealthy time. And when Solomon... Uh, died, his son, Rehoboam, is who we're talking about. Rehoboam becomes the king. Rehoboam only reigned over Israel for two years. In the two years, this is where he got the counsel from the young men. Raise taxes. Uh, make um, the uh, crimes more severe. Uh, give them 14 years instead of, you know, you know what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? Let's, let's make these crimes, these crimes, these crimes against the state are horrible. Uh, we give them years and years and years. I, I know of a couple of young men that were in a Christian school in Texas, and um, these two young men were the sons of a pastor, and they were running the Christian school, and there was a young boy that was out of control, and the two young men took that young boy into the office, and they paddled him to try to get him straightened up. It went to the court, parents sued, and the parents said, this was mental, emotional abuse, and those two young preacher boys, uh, son, that was two sons, sons of the pastor, ended up in prison with 25 years. Peace. They both had young families and children, 25 years. And a child molester will get out in three. That's ridiculous. Did, should they have done what they didn't know? But I'm going to tell you, in the 70s, uh, it was common. It happened in the public school. And th they would have two people there, one as a witness. But they claimed that these two guys ganged up. And the, the boys, as far as I know, are still sitting in prison today. Uh, this happened uh, not too long ago. Uh, some of the unbalance of, of the court system right now, and I don't want to get into that, but I'll tell you that I just want you to relate a little bit to what was going on in that day. See, what happened was, Rehoboam's there, and he's got all these young people, and he's saying, boy, we want to do this, and we want to do this, and we want this money, we need this money for this, and this party, and we're going to throw um, a national party and bring everybody around the world in to see how great we are, and it's going to cost all this money, and we're going to drink, and we're going to need all these drinks, and we're going to need all this stuff to have these big parties, so we need more money, so we're going to have to raise taxes. Uh, we need a bigger house. We need to add on to the palace and all these things that we have to have because we need it. We deserve it. We're running, running the government and so we need all this money. You see how that happens? So Israel decided to rebel against their king. There are 12 tribes in Israel. Ten tribes broke off. There was another guy. His name was Jeroboam who had been exiled to Egypt by Solomon because of an insurrection. 
Jeroboam hears about what's going on. He comes back and he becomes the leader of the ten tribes, the northern ten tribes that became known as Israel. Jeroboam became the king that started a line. Uh, this is where Ahab was. Ahab was the king of Israel, remember? Uh, they set up in Samaria and there was a long line of wicked kings. In fact, Jeroboam was very wicked. If you read through the Old Testament, you'll find this king was like the king. His sin was like the king of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who caused Israel to sin. Jeroboam began to bring back idol worship and that kind of thing. The southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, broke off and stayed with the house of David, the throne of David, and they followed. So now we have Judah in the south and Israel in the north, which is the northern ten tribes. So those northern ten tribes completely broke off. It would be like if America decided if the federal government, Nancy Pelosi became president, um, Bernie Sanders became the vice president, and they decided uh, that they were going to begin to tax America, and California and New York went with them, and the rest of us said no. Make sense? We're not going to pay taxes to the federal government. We're not going to do that kind of thing. That's kind of how it happened. And I'm not suggesting that for those of you listening online, going back and checking to see what I've said in the past. If you're watching this right now, uh, and it's 10 years from now and I'm running for president, and uh, you want to see what I believe, no, I won't. I promise, hon, I won't. I won't. She's like, no, I'm going to divorce you. If you run. Anyway, so, so, so anyway, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is that, that, that um, you can see how this happens. The message I want to give you tonight is that this whole story is actually a picture of something. Something spiritual. I want you to see that. Um, I need a couple young people to help me out with this. Uh, who can I have? Anybody volunteer? Wade, Ethan, you volunteer? Did Wade and Ethan volunteer? Have you guys had this on your neck before? Uh, have you had this on your Can you fit your head through there? You may not. You, you probably can't fit your head through there. I don't know if you can. If you can't fit your head through there, no, you can't. Can you fit your head through there? You guys have got big heads, you know that? Okay, so what I want you to do is just kind of hold that together, you on this side and you on this side, but inside like this. And just pretend it's around your neck. I want you to, people to look at it, okay? You don't have to put it around your neck. Don't wrap it around anybody's neck. Okay, so what you have there, so that's a... That's a junior uh, uh, yoke. It's a small yoke for small oxen. Uh, actually, it's a trainer yoke uh, that my father-in-law found at a, an auction somewhere. And they would have these small, small oxen side by side and they start training them how to plow and that kind of thing. That's what that is. But this is a yoke. Okay? What happens in a yoke is when two oxen are put in this yoke, if one of them decides he wants to go that way, um, the other one's going to go with him. It doesn't matter where you go, this, this yoke ties you together. Does that make sense? You can't, you can't decide to have a mind of your own. Sometimes the horses would, they would line up and they would have a team of horses and they might have a, um, um, a bar, I'm trying to think of what they call it, uh, a bar down the center. Does anybody remember what they call it? And a, and a cross tree, I think is what they called it. And they would have the horses hooked to that. And if the horses decided they got a mind of their own and one wants to go this way, the others would just keep them. Hold them. Okay, and uh, that's what would happen. You keep that's just how you keep a couple of animals together. Now, when the Lord's talking about this yoke, he's in here. He said, "The yoke um, that I'm going to put on you." This is what Rehoboam is saying. He said, "The yoke I'm going to put on you is going to be harder." And the problem is, when I put this yoke on you, you can't get away from it. it you're stuck. I'm going to be on one side. You're going to be on the other. You're going to help me. And you're going to go where I want you to go. And it's going to be a heavy yoke. And it's going to be a hard yoke. And we're going to put a lot of weight on. And you're going to be pulling the weight. And I'm just walking beside you. You're going to be doing the work. It's basically what he's saying. So, um, the picture here is of the old law. The old law was something that was put on Israel's neck. The commandments were put on Israel's neck. If they wanted to walk with God and they wanted to serve God,
They had to get in that yoke of the law. They had to obey. If they didn't, they were in trouble. They were Jews. They, um, they had to follow all of the commands. I'm going to show you a little bit of that in a, in a second. Here guys, you can put that down and go sit down. Thank you very much. Just set it right down on the floor. I want you to go to Acts chapter 15, if you would go there with me. Acts chapter 15. And I want to, I want to scroll down several years now. And what's happened is in the early church, all the Jews have gotten saved. Remember Pentecost? 3,000 Jews get saved, and a couple days later, 5,000 Jews get saved, and then the church is multiplied. And we've read up to this point in several different chapters. We read this morning uh, that when Paul stopped persecuting the church, the church began to grow and, um, and multiply. And just in Acts 6, when they added deacons, the church multiplied. It's just every time you find something happening, the church multiplies. I mean, think about it, 8,000 people excited and really interested in reaching people, reaching the lost, and the church just is exploding. By the time we get to Acts 15, there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of Christians all of them in Jerusalem. And all of them Jews. Now, some of them have decided that they are going to tell the new Christians, the young ones, and teach them. They're having classes and they're teaching them about the old law. In fact, um, I want to show you this. Um, keep your finger in Acts 15. I, I want to give you this verse before I forget it. Because I, I had uh, meant to write it down earlier and I, I spaced. But in, in uh, 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse, verse um, 4 says, Why, wow, I got dust all over me from that thing. Uh, it says this uh, Neither give heed to fables, endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith so do. The end of the commandment is charity out of pure heart, and so on. Verse 6, from which some having swerved have turned aside into vain jangling. Look at this. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, nor whereof they, aff whereof they affirm. So, there were people that were trying to teach the law. They were saying, let's have this deep Bible study and let's begin to understand what was going on. I remember several years ago, I had a, um, a lady in our church... Um, and she had brought to me Beth Moore's material on the tabernacle. And I read through it. She wanted to do a ladies' Bible study. And I read through it. And I'm like, wow, this is messed up. That's messed up. So I took the, took the Bible study that Beth Moore had written and, and I rewrote it and gave her <laughs> uh, sheets based on Beth Moore. And we called it the Beth Moore Bible study back then because it was before she started preaching. And uh, she was just a ladies' Bible study. And uh, it was, it was, uh, and I, I, I was struck by the fact that this lady, who was not supposed to be teaching her super authority in the church doctrinally, was teaching doctrinal truths out of the, out of the um, Old Testament to, 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 to mixed groups, mixed, mixed, you know, men and women. That's what that was her, and that was wrong. It's wrong. The Bible says not to do that. And I was struck by how she, she, she was confused about some of her deep things. And pe people were re going, back in those days, everybody was going gaga over Beth Moore. Said, wow, this lady is giving us deep Bible study stuff. Like, there's a lot of people that will give you stuff that you never heard before that doesn't help you at all. Just because they come up with some nugget of truth that's three layers down underneath a rock in a different language doesn't mean it's going to help you. Seriously. And so, um, that was a problem in the early church. I mean, these people, there was a lot of guys who were taking the law. Now, let me explain to you what the law means here. And uh, Paul said, they don't know what you're talking about. It's just vain jangling. Don't worry about it. And in Acts 15, this, this problem came to the church. It was really one of the first councils the church had got together to determine doctrinal things and guys, let me tell you something. The Lord has given us the responsibility of keeping the doctrine pure. And a lot of times, 
we have these discussions, doctrinal discussions, and we need to have doctrinal discussions. And if you have questions, the Bible tells us, let's, let's get it out there. Let's talk about this. We need to keep the doctrine straight. God has committed that to our trust. We are responsible for that. You young men growing up, you realize you are responsible for the doctrine for the next generation. It is our job to keep it pure. And that's what these guys were doing. What was happening all of a sudden by Acts 15, from Acts 10 to Acts 15, Christians are getting saved. And all of a sudden, Gentiles are coming into the church and some of these Jewish teachers are saying, let me explain to you, let's have a Bible study, let's explain to you what the law means. And you guys need to do this, and you need to do this, and you need to do this. So in verse 1, certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren and said, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let me tell you something. Listen. Listen carefully. The Gospel of Jesus Christ is simple and plain. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want to debate with me over whether or not you have to repent to be saved, I don't have time to talk to you. Here's the problem. People say, well, you've got to repent. That's important. Well, you've got to do this. You've got to do this. You've got, you got to know what time and date you're saved. You don't know the time and date you're saved, you're not saved, they say. This isn't true. If you don't know the exact time, well, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know the exact time I was born, but I know I was born. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know anything. I don't know what the hospital looked like or anything. I don't know anything about it. I was born. When you get when you get saved, you're born into the family of God. You may not remember the exact time date. You may not remember it. When we start adding to salvation, we confuse things. Can anybody say amen to that? You know that's true. You've heard guys get up and say these things. So these guys are coming down. And they're adding to the Gospel. They're adding and they said, well, you have to do this and you have to do that. And uh, when verse 2 says, when therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. And let me, let me um, give you another sidebar real quick. We live in a day when the morality seems to be don't rock the boat. If somebody says something that's wrong, just be gracious. Uh, you should be gracious, but the Bible talks about salt and grace, right? Sometimes there needs to be dissension. And if a preacher stands up and says something wrong, there ought to be dissension. Hello! Because he can send people to hell. He can confuse people. There ought to be some dissension and there ought to be some open discussion. Now, are you listening to me? I'm telling you, that's what you need to know your Bible. If the preacher says something that's a little off, you better know your Bible. I'm very careful about who we have preach at youth conferences and those kinds of things. I never used to be careful about that. I was having a youth conference. I had hosted a youth conference for 21 years. And I had um, an average of five, four, five, six guys a year preach at this conference. Sometimes a couple more. And uh, one year I had this one guy get, and I had to, my wife could take, I had to get up from the back and walk forward in the middle of a sermon. Say, God bless you, your time's up. Because he got off on the stuff he shouldn't have been saying. I get really nervous about what they tell our children at camps and things. Because there's some weird stuff out there. Trust me. So, um, anyway, when somebody, somebody tells, gives my church or the people, my young people a, a false doctrine, there, there should be some dissension. And there was no small dissension. Paul and Barnabas said, you guys are teaching wrong. They came to the church in Jerusalem. They came to Jerusalem and received, and um, there rose up uh, people from the Pharisees that believed. And they said in verse 5, it was needful to circumcise and to command, command them to keep the law of Moses. Verse 6, and the apostles and elders came together for to consider this matter. And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, 
Ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the Gospel and believe. And God which knoweth the hearts bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as He did unto us, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why tempt ye God? Look at this verse 10. Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But if we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they, then all the multitude kept silence. The church is... Wait, 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 wait. There's something wrong here. You guys are teaching that now you have to go back to the law. And he said, that's wrong. That's a yoke of bondage. I want you to go over to Romans 14. Would you go there with me? Romans 14. You've probably heard this before. Verse 1 says, Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. And see what's happening? Early church, a lot of people were being healed. Guys were coming in and said, boy, I'm not healed, I'm sick, I, mean, I need to, have to take some medicine. I'm going to take the medicine for the things that are my ailments. And other guys were saying, you don't have enough faith. And Paul said, that's not your business. If they want to take herbs because they're weak and they need, need some medications, they need something, oh, that's okay. Don't despise them. Uh, verse 3, Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? Verse 5, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth to the Lord eateth to the Lord, for he that giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. What's he saying here? He's saying, stop judging each other, because your judgment is of the law. You're judging each other by the law. Now, I'm going to tie this all together here in a minute, so stick with me. I know there's a, there's a lot of random pieces here. Please stay with me. My thoughts are not random. It's just the thoughts are the, the, the points are, are coming together. We've got, to, we've got to lay several strings out so we can weave them together. Um, Galatians chapter 5. Go there, Galatians 5. Verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with what? The yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Talking about feast days. I know a lot of people, there's, there's people out there right now um, that, are, that are, are fascinated by the Jewish culture. And that's okay. I've sat through a Passover. My family and I have sat through a Passover celebration by some people who are not Jews who are trying to celebrate the Passover at Easter and all that kind of stuff. And it was fun and enjoyed it. But it's not something you have to follow. And if they want to follow, it's okay. There's a whole lot of Jewish feast days that mean nothing to us. And the Jews still keep them, and that's fine. There is a group uh, out, of, out of Illinois. Uh, I've, I've looked. They're actually spreading around the world right now. They're called the Israel of God. Has anybody heard of them? The Israel of God. This group that I um, just, just heard about them this week, and they are teaching that you have to keep the law. You have to worship on Saturday, because that's the Sabbath day. You guys heard of the Seventh-day Adventists? They're very, very similar to the Seventh-day Adventists. And they're Christians. They believe in the blood of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ saved them, from, but they keep the law. Some of them, Jehovah's Witnesses, they will not let, get blood infusions or anything like that because they think the, that's a sin. And they, they, it gets tighter and tighter. The rules get tighter and tighter. Uh, gets to some, some sects will, um, will uh, fight with you over what you wear. And if you don't wear a certain thing, then 
uh, you're you're out, you're out. Um, when I was uh, when I was brought up in a fundamental group where women were not allowed to wear pants, and um, some of you were too. And uh, when I stopped preaching, that was when I realized that there was one verse in the Bible, the whole Bible that had to be extrapolated and twisted to make it say what we were making it say. Just one verse. And there's nowhere else in the Bible that supported the idea that women should not wear pants. Nowhere else. But there's one verse if you you had to take our culture, the way our culture is, and put it together with the verse to come up with this. And then... I don't care if you, what you believe on this. It doesn't matter. You, you, can, if you can be strong on this or not. It doesn't matter. But I began to realize that that one thing, that one verse, extrapolated, laid over our culture, applied to our culture, American culture, only American culture in our generation, last 100 years, will it even fit? When I realized that, and I started talking about it, preachers would say to me in preachers' conference, they would whisper to me and they would say, I know, brother, but we got to preach this. And I'm like, why? And then I would debate these guys and ask them and just say, show me, prove to me from the Scripture this is right. And then I found out that if you withdraw from that position, you get blackballed and people say you're walking away from the Bible and they tell you you're dropping your standards and the Bible doesn't even deal with it at all. So a modesty. Well, you've got to take the word modesty and you've got to turn it and twist it and explain it. And you have to do a dance like nobody's business to get that doctrine proved. And I realized that that doctrine was being held up as a standard by which we would define whether a person was fundamental or not. And then I went and read the Bible and it says, don't judge another man on what he eats or how he celebrates a day. Now, the Bible teaches women you should be modest. Men you should be modest. It teaches that. It teaches, it teaches very clearly that a woman should not wear that which pertains to a man and a man should not wear a woman's garment. Very clearly. It teaches that. And then in the Old Testament, uh, every time you find the word skirt in the Old Testament, it's a man wearing it. A skirt was for a man. And that, that, that's kind of... These guys will get up and these... I get invitations all the time to these old past conferences. I, I, I don't have time to waste on it. I don't want to go there and sit and listen to some guy tell me that the Bible says that a woman should never wear a man's breeches. I'm not going to waste my time. Because it's one verse extrapolated and layered and two, three generations out to even prove the point. And that becomes the standard by which we measure everyone's spirituality. And when I realized it, I realized that we had fallen into the trap of legalism way, way, way deep into it. And I want to tell you something. I said, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not, part, I'm not participating. I'm not participating. At that time, uh, there was some... Uh, I really got blacklisted. I got blacklisted horribly. You cannot imagine. I got blacklisted really bad at some fundamental churches. And so I wrote a book on the subject. You can get the books on Amazon called Does God Care What You Wear? It's, I put the print Bible principles in it. If you want to get it, you can get it. You can download it. Watch it PDF. You can, you can see it on, on, on the internet if you want. Um, but the, the thing is, when, when I, I, I pulled away from that, people started saying, well, Haefeli's dropped his standards. Now he doesn't preach the King James anymore. He's going to go contemporary. And wow, he's got a guitar in his church now. Yeah. They started telling, saying things like that. And I remember at that time, there was this new lady's garment that came out called the Capri. Does anybody know what that is? Okay, and so I told my wife, I said, I want you to go get some you know, Capris. And it's okay for you to wear them. And I had, a, I had a, someone on staff at my church that came in. And, and said he fasted and prayed all night because my wife was, he saw my wife wearing a pair of capris. He fasted and prayed because he thought I had left the Lord. I'd walked away from God. Now think about that. 
capris, which is not a man's garment. You, you won't catch me dead in a pair of capris. Please. If I was wearing capris, you wouldn't even need a camera in here to be so bright. I'm telling you. <laughs> Got your attention, didn't I? Honest. This is ridiculous. So I, I'm not going to tell you the depth of conversations I've had. I can tell you privately, I'm not going to tell you the depth of conversations I've had on this subject. But it is absolutely crazy how far people have gotten with clothing standards. And some of them will wear, the women have to wear head coverings because they have to be modest and cover their hair. they got this little doily that the whole, I don't know what, if the demons only miss three hairs or what the deal is they're talking about. But it's, it's, it's amazing. Some of them get these little coffee filters they put on top. And uh, it's, it's amazing. It's just amazing uh, what we will do and how we will box ourselves into a corner. And, and while we're talking about contemporary music, the same thing is with music. I have noticed that we have preached about stuff, about music, and we've gotten so far into a corner some people have, that you can't even enjoy praise the Lord. There's this guy who was going around teaching lessons on, on godly music and he said if you tap your foot when the music is playing, that music is speaking to your flesh and it's ungodly. You heard that? Is that ridiculous? I heard a guy say that if you played music with a drum, that your music was rooted in Africa and classical music is from Europe and God blessed Europe, and beat music, music with a drum beat and stuff, uh, you stay away from that because that's from Africa and God, I was, it's the dark continent. I'm like, you're a racist. I cannot even believe this guy was a teacher. He spoke in the chapel at Bob Jones University many, many times. Considered a fundamental fundamentalist. Well-known name. Wow! It's like, what are we doing to ourselves? We are we're falling into this trap. We're taking this yoke that's heavy. And boy, we got to be careful not to be seen. I remember my dad telling me about this, this gal that is a secretary for this um, mission agency. And she stuck a white pencil in her mouth and somebody snapped a picture and it went out that she was smoking a cigarette and they literally, they literally got her husband thrown out of a position because they saw a picture proved beyond a shadow of a doubt we have this on good authority that she was smoking a cigarette and it was a pencil. It's insane. Ah, uh, you say, well, I don't know about that. Well, I know I could tell you case after case after case after case. If, you, if, if you've been around churches or been in the uh, politics of churches, you'll know people will get cornered and branded and it's horrible. It's horrible. Now, he says here, verse 4, Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Luck. Luck. I don't care, ladies, if you got your hair piled so high you've got to duck your head to come through this door. And you got your skirt so long you got dirt on it on the hem as you're dragging walking through the door. If you don't know how to keep your mouth shut and you're a gossip and a murmurer and you're a nasty person, you've fallen from grace. I remember a um, standard that we'd had in our church was that no Sunday school teachers could wear, uh, the ladies could not wear pants at a time when I took over the church. And I remember this one lady was just, boy, she was, she not only, only wore a dress, but she made sure that everyone else did. And if she caught anybody else doing this, I mean, it, she was tattling. But she was a Sunday school teacher. And it was this other lady that had just gotten saved and she was gracious and kind and sweet-spirited. And I'm thinking, boy, 
I'd rather have her teaching our children than this battle axe. I'm just being honest with you. I was in a meeting not too long ago. Saw some guys. I, I quit running in that crowd. I'll be honest with you. I don't run in those, those little guys. I don't spend any time with them at all. And I, I ran into some old friends that I hadn't seen in 20 years. And then I remembered why I hadn't seen them in 20 years. They got me in the corner and I said, oh, you're from such and such an area. You know my good friend, brother so-and-so. Oh, brother. Said, I saw his wife wearing pants the other day. He's really falling off, getting walking away from the Lord. I'm like, I looked at him and I said, What? I said, No. I said, That's one of the godliest men I know. He walks with the Lord. So does his wife. They're the sweetest couple. I, they're building a church from scratch. They build this church from scratch. They're, they're on to building another one. They're serving the Lord, winning people to God. What are you talking about? See, we're spending so much time crossing our T's and dotting our I's that we completely lose grace and we, <coughs> we can't win anybody to God because they can't reach the level we're at. When uh, a young lady got saved in our church, she came into our church and I remember, I remember she came in a really beautiful pantsuit. She, was, she, was, uh, she walked in that first Sunday. She got saved. She was a manager in our town. And um, in one of the stores... She'd read a gospel tract. Somebody had given to her. She got saved. And uh, oh, everybody was so excited. She'd gotten saved. It was wonderful. And the ladies of the church got around her and told her she needed to wear a dress. And so the next day she came, or the next Sunday, she came looking in a dress, buddy. It was short. Really short. And the, the ladies, older ladies, were saying, Wow, bless her heart. She's learning. I'm like, I think she went backwards. Went from modest to, to hooker. Can I say that in public? I mean, it was bad. And they were all, oh, this is great. She's wearing a dress. Hello. You missed the point. You made the commandment of God of none effect through your traditions. The commandment of God was modesty. Hello. That's the number one priority there. Right? Less materials, not better. Boy, wow. You guys didn't need to hear this tonight, did you? So, Colossians chapter 2. Stick with me. We're having fun though, aren't we? Ripping on everybody. Isn't that great? I'm hoping, I'm hoping some of my buddies that disagree with me will watch this on YouTube. That would be a wonderful, wonderful gift from God. I, pray, I, would, I would be blessed. I just, I just like causing trouble sometimes. No, seriously, I really believe this stuff. I really believe it. I'm really angry and, and, and feel... I understand the word dissension in the church. I understand why people fight about this. And some of you have never heard this stuff before, and you're looking at me like, what in the world's his problem? Well, it just comes from a long line of listening to fundamental Baptists that have gotten, gotten themselves all twisted up in their doctrines. Here's what it says in Colossians 2. Verse 10, and ye are complete in Him. Very, very important to understand. Look, when you boil it all down, my friends, when you boil it all down, you're going to find out that you need to trust in the Lord, you need to have faith in Him, and you need to grow in grace. And those are the number two things, or top two things in your Christian life. Grow in grace and in faith. You need to learn. You need to repent of your sins. You need to change. You need to clean up. You need to do all those things. But you need to have faith and you have grace, and those are the number two priorities in your life. You work on those two things first before you work on anything else. The rest of the stuff will come, little by little by little. We've got to let people that are brand new Christians grow. And that means that doesn't mean we, give them, we run them through a quick primer on how to dress right and how to quit whatever we think they ought to quit. Look, if you're good at winning the lottery, I'm not going to say anything about it for a while. Just tithe. I'm going to teach you how to tithe. No. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh my goodness. Colossians chapter 2 again. He says in verse 13, "...and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, have be quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses." 
blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. The ordinances which were against us, which were contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. And I want to say to you, the principalities and powers He's referring to are the Pharisees and Sadducees who had let the devil take over their doctrines. The devil had moved in. He says in the church, he says, I know where Satan's seed is. That bitter spirit falling from grace and that anger and that judgmental attitude. He knew the devil had taken over. And we saw it happen with the Pharisees, the religious crowd that were so careful with their law and doing everything exactly right. They lost track of themselves and they crucified Jesus Christ. I've seen the same thing happen in churches. People lose track of themselves and crucify the people who are supposed to be bringing grace. I've seen it happen. Some of you have too. He says, let no man therefore, verse 16, judge you in me or drink or in respect of the holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Verse 20, Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using. All this stuff, you say, we can't do that, can't do that, don't have that, don't do that. Yes, you can do this, yes, you can do that. He said, why do you have this list of do's and don'ts? I found out when I got so confused about music when I was young, trying to figure out what was godly music and what wasn't. I remember I had all these records. Oh my goodness. Some of my favorite groups, Blackwood Brothers was one of them. Some of my favorite groups, and then I got convicted one time, a guy in a youth conference preached against all that ungodly, worldly music, the Gaither stuff. Ooh, they preached against Gaither. Has anybody anybody ever been in a church where they preached against Gaither? You have? Oh, Gaither's wicked and mild, he said. Oh, we're singing one of those in our choir. But, but, Wow, why do you say that? Well, because it's just so fleshly and so makes you want to dance and stuff. I was so confused. I remember getting rid of all of my records and going out and getting, going to Goodwill and buying Beethoven and Tchaikovsky. And if I'm supposed to listen to classical, I'm going to try to learn to like it. Buddy, that lasted about a month. I got so depressed, I wanted to shoot myself. Now, if you like Tchaikovsky and Beethoven, God bless you. That's because that's what you like. I just don't. If you like broccoli and cook carrots, God bless you. God put them here for you. I'm going to let you have them all. I'll have bacon. You know, seriously. I got so confused about all that. They said, well, classical music is right. And this is just do's and don'ts. And I found out something. The Holy Spirit if He's alive and well in you, will tell you that's wrong music and that's right music. You're listening to something, the Holy Spirit will say, you oughtn't to be listening to that. And you know what you do? Turn it off. Or turn the channel. Or whatever. Right? Hello? Did the Holy Spirit talk to you? I got into a fight this week with a bunch of preachers. Yeah, it was... I'm sorry. I didn't have time to waste on it, but I did. They said something and it made me. it ticked me off. And so I got online and I started arguing with them. I said, look, let the Holy Spirit guide you guys. And and a bunch of them got on my case and one of them said, Brother Hayfley, what you're suggesting is very dangerous. Following the Holy Spirit is dangerous? Well, we're giving freedom in ways that we shouldn't. What? What? Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you what? Come on, people! Christianity is a life of joy and peace, not restriction. I'm telling you, you don't, you don't want, listen, you don't want the world, the, the, you sow to the flesh, you'll have the flesh reaps corruption. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But understand something. There is liberty of decisions. There's liberty of choices. There's liberty. God has given you the opportunity to make choices. And He says, don't judge someone else. Right? And if you do, what's happened? You've just stuck your head in the yoke 
and you are responsible for wherever that yoke takes you. Quickly, I've been having so much fun, I, I got to wrap this up. I want to show you a couple things. Real quick. Go back to Leviticus 24. I just want to show you a verse real quick. Leviticus. I want to illustrate how hard the law was. Leviticus 24, look what it says. In verse 12. Well, okay, so we have in verse 10. The son of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian, went out among the children of Israel, and, his, and this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed, and they brought him unto Moses. His mother's name was Shalomath, the daughter of Debri, the tribe of Dan. And they put him in, a, in ward that the mind of the Lord might be showed them. Now it's interesting, the tribe of Dan, Dan means judge. Daniel means judge of God. El, whenever you have a, a name with E-L on the bottom, or on the last of it, E-L stands for, for God, and it's, a, it's Hebrew. Okay? So any, any name with, that ends in E-L has Hebrew roots, and it's that E-L means God. So Daniel means judge of God. Dan means judge. Interesting, in Revelation, the uh, 144,000, Dan, the tribe of Dan, is removed. That's a... That's a List of grace. It's all about grace. It's about Judas. About Jesus. I'll just throw that in for free. But this, this right here, he said, this guy, of uh, this, this guy was from the tribe of Dan. And verse twelve says they put him in a ward. The mind of the Lord might be showed them. They didn't know what to do. This guy blasphemed. He's got gotten a fight with somebody, and he cussed, and they didn't know what to do. So they put him in a ward. I'm gonna tell you something. When I got into a fight with my sister and I cussed, my mom knew exactly what to do. We went back to the bathroom ward and I got my mouth washed out with soap. But anyway, that's another story. I've told you before. Go to Numbers. Numbers chapter 15. Put him in a ward. Look at this. This is what happened. In verse 32 of Numbers 15. Um, and while the children of, of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man, watch this now, that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. Uh oh. Gathered sticks on the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And look what verse 34 says. And they put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And verse 35 says, The Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death for gathering sticks on, the Saturday, on Saturday. That's the law, my friends. The law doesn't have any give. So, well, that doesn't sound gracious. No, what you need to understand is the law is a yoke. And it's difficult. And it's hard. And it's unforgiving. And there's no grace in the law. The law has no grace. The law is perfect, but it has no grace. Wherever, when you're yoked to the law, wherever the law takes you, that's where you go. The law says if you're gathering sticks on the Sabbath day, you need to be executed, then that's what has to happen. You don't have the right to change that. It's God's law. You don't have the right. Now, why would somebody want to go back to that when you're relieved from that? In the New Testament, when Jesus took those things and, and nailed them to the cross, he, he released us from that. Let me show you something. Remember that story I told you about Rehoboam? In the very beginning, and I told you how that his friends said, let's make it harder. That's exactly what the early church was doing. They were tacking on things. And what a lot of churches do today, they tack on stuff, add stuff to salvation, add stuff to the Word of God. They add, 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 and make it so hard that you can't even breathe. You don't know. I mean, listen, some of you guys are afraid to do stuff because you're afraid the preacher will catch you. Why? What can I do? If I catch you sneaking into the movie theater, 
So what? What am I going to do? Put you in a ward and execute you at sunrise? No, if I decide this thing or that thing is wrong, or I mean, can't even breathe. <laughs> My wife and I went and saw a movie the other night, it was some time ago, and we saw some Christian friends of ours, and there was a Christian movie out. And most of the time, I, I, I don't like cheesy Christian movies, I'll just be honest with you. I'd, I'd rather watch um, Wyatt Earp or Bruce Willis or something blowing up than watch a cheesy Christian movie. I'm I just not into it. I've never watched The Passion of the Christ and never intend to. In fact, when I watch a movie and they're talking in another language and they say, you just read on the side. If I wanted to read a book, I would stay home and read a book. And I don't want to hear it in a different language and watch the English on the screen. I don't know, maybe some of you watched The Passion of the Christ. God bless you. It's fine if you enjoyed it. That's wonderful. But I didn't want to see it. I didn't care. I didn't want to see some hippie dude dressed up in a bloody outfit. You know, if I want to see blood and guts, I want to see something that's a little more action. He said, well, you're being sacrilegious. Not at all. Uh, Mel Gibson is not Jesus. Neither is the guy that played Jesus in them. He's not Jesus. I'm not being sacrilegious at all. In fact, I'm a little disgusted by it. It's, it's not based on the Bible. It's based on a, on a dream by a Roman Catholic priest. But I digress. The thing is, we were, we were watching this movie, and it was not the Christian movie, and these other friends of ours were in here, and they were watching. Well, are, are you here to see this same Christian movie? And I'm like, no. Now, I was, heard Bruce was on the screen over here. I'm in here to watch that. You know. <laughs> God bless you. You guys go enjoy that cheesy flick. <laughs> Go enjoy it. It's great. If you like it, go enjoy it. Enjoy it. I don't care. I'm not judging you for enjoying it. If you want to that help yourself. Are you getting me? Listen. Listen. I grew up in an environment where if, a, if somebody wanted to watch a movie, they went to a different town and hoped nobody saw their car. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Hmm? What is that? Are we supposed to be that kind of Christian? Are you getting my point? We're not supposed to be those kind of Christians. We're, we're, we're putting a yoke on like Rehoboam. Saying, ah, we're going to make that yoke heavier and harder. Are you guys getting the point? Now, turn to Matthew. And we're done. If you got the point, you promised me you got the point, I'll conclude. Matthew 11. You want me to land the plane, Jeff? All right. Here goes. We're going to land it. Flaps are out. Gears down. We have aimed at the runway. But don't miss what I'm going to tell you. Matthew 11. Come unto me, verse 28, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see, if Jesus had been telling Rehoboam what to do with that yoke, he'd have said, lighten the load. Do you know what he did? The Pharisees came to him and said, Good Master, what is the, what is the most important commandment in the law? And Jesus said, first one, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. You know what I find Jesus doing over and over and over again? Skinning away all the stuff that was unnecessary and getting in their face and saying, this is all that matters. I want to tell you something. Listen to me. The yoke of Jesus Christ, He says, is so easy. It's easy because of this. Basically, what you have in the yoke of Jesus Christ is this. You have two rules. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Measure everything you do religiously with that. 
metric. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's what you measure your religious and spiritual spirit experience with. The second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Every way you interact with anyone else, simply use that metric. Is this something I would want done to me? Or is this something I would want said about me? Is this something that, that I can do and love them? Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, everything in the law hangs on these two rules. It's that simple. Now, are we, are we supposed to be concerned about those things? Yes, we are. We're supposed to live that way. We're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul, right? That's part of the law that we're supposed to keep. But it's not complicated. Oh, if I'm gathering sticks on Saturday, well, is, is that one of the laws? Um, uh, let's see. Can I talk? This is one of the debates the rabbis had before Jesus uh, was born. That's another story. Was um, Can I talk to someone on a listening device over a mile on the Sabbath day. You should debate that. Because they weren't supposed to travel more than a mile on the Sabbath day or they were working. So they had to, if they, if they talked to somebody on a listening device over a mile, was it, was it legal? Was it a law or not? Could they do it and get by with it? Huh. That sounds kind of heavy, doesn't it? You know, the Christian life, you, when you got saved, you did not just add a whole bunch of new rules to your life. And now you've got to figure out what to do. do. Am I dressing right? Am I looking right? Am I saying right? Can I listen to this song? Can I watch that thing? No. Don't add that stuff to your life. All that does is put stress. What are people going to think? Stop it. Who cares? Don't measure your life by what people think of you. That's not Christianity. Measure yourself. Don't put a stumbling block in someone else. But measure yourself. It, it might, do I love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength? Do I love my neighbor as myself? Measure yourself. by That's the yoke. That's, easy, that's an easy yoke. People, people have boiled down their faith to what would Jesus do? WWJD. And so... All these wristbands are going around WWJD. And so a bunch of guys got mad about it and said, well, this is just pie in the sky. Light Christianity. Christianity light. You know, I, I think what would Jesus do is a really good rule to measure things by. It's really simple. Christianity, salvation is really easy. Didn't Jesus say that? I know maybe the preacher 50 years ago that you heard that you loved and adored said something different. He told you to love and adore Him too, didn't you? He commanded you to respect Him, didn't He? To honor Him. Because He was the man of God. Hmm? But Jesus said, My yoke is easy and My burden is light. And I'm going to tell you something. This, believe it or not, is one of the hardest messages I've ever preached to this church. Because I want you to get this. It's so important. You're getting it though, aren't you? You're understanding it. Most of you are nodding your heads. And that's why I'm going to let you go early tonight. So, we're going to bring it right now. We're going to stop and pray. I think I've said everything I need to say. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for giving us people to teach us and to show us the truth. And Father, thank You for giving us the Word of God in our own language that we can sort these things out for ourselves. And Thank You for the Holy Spirit that teaches us in, our, in us. And Lord, thank You for making our yoke easy. and Forgive us when we make it difficult and lay burdens on people that they're not supposed to have to bear. And we'll thank You, Lord, for all Your help and strength and guidance in the future. We don't want to pervert anything. We don't want to be liberal. We don't want to be um, empty in our, in our faith. But God, we want, we want so bad to do it the way You want it done. Thank you for your guidance. In Jesus' name, amen.